You're unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. Today's unbelievable lesson is going to be all about an introduction to forces and to force diagrams. But first we must ask ourselves, what is a force? Well, a force is an interaction between two or more objects that results in a push or a pull. It's important to note that we must have two objects that are interacting with each other to be able to have some sort of force. There's two different types of forces. We have contact forces, um, and that's when we have two objects that are in direct contact. And we also have long range forces. That's when the two objects can interact at a distance without even touching each other. Now, that might seem a little bit weird at first. I mean, two objects can actually push or pull on each other without actually touching. And no, I'm not talking about using a rope, because the rope is still touching. That would be a contact force. Huh. Well, let's talk a little bit more and see if we can figure out just what those long-range forces are. Here are a couple of uh, examples of what contact forces include. First of all, friction is a contact force. It's a contact force between the surface of something and an object. And a frictional force is always going to be parallel to the surface. So if our surface is nice and horizontal, like a, a, a pen sitting on top of it, and we're trying to push, the amount of friction would be parallel to that surface. Likewise, if our surface is diagonal and I put the pen on there, it won't move because there's friction that's pulling kind of up at that diagonal. Another contact force would be the normal force. This is a contact force between the surface of something and an object, and that force is perpendicular to the surface. For example, a box that's sitting up on top of the table, well, gravity is pulling it down, but the reason it's not falling down is because the table is pushing up on the box. So the table is exerting a normal force. Now the word normal uh, might be a bit confusing, so let me clarify how we get the name normal. The word normal is actually a mathematical word, and they use it in math to represent anything that is perpendicular. For example, they frequently talk about normal lines. That's two lines that actually cross and intersect and are perpendicular. So when, you, when we use the term normal, we don't mean like regular or your average Joe kind of a normal, but we mean perpendicular. And that's how you can remember that a normal force is a force that's always perpendicular to the surface. Another contact force would be tension, like the rope we talked about before. You have to be touching the rope for the rope to be able to pull on you. And the last contact force that we're going to discuss is an applied force. This is kind of a little more of a vague force. A lot of different things could exert an applied force. But it would be a force that is exerting on some objects, like a person, that doesn't really fall into any of these previous categories but it's still a push or a pull that's not from one of those three. Now, here's a couple of examples of long-range forces, right? This mysterious force that doesn't seem to make any sense because how could something push or pull on you without touching you? Well, gravity, that's the most common type of long-range force. If you were to jump up into the air, even though you're no longer touching the surface of the Earth, the Earth is still going to pull you back down. Otherwise, every time you hit the baseball, it would be a grand slam and go out into outer space. Every time you jumped on the trampoline, bye-bye family, you're going outer space. Fortunately, gravitational forces are not a contact force. They act over long, long distances, like the sun and the earth. That's what keeps the earth in orbit around the sun, is that gravitational pull. And the earth and the moon. The moon stays next to the earth because of that gravitational force even though they're not touching. Another couple of different ones would be the magnetic force and an electric force, like two magnets that repel without touching. Same thing with two electrons that have an electric force, they'll repel. Now, for the most part this year, we're really only going to talk about the force of gravity. We will talk a little bit about magnetic and electric forces at the end of the year, and we might casually mention it as a type of force, but we're really not going to solve for them too frequently during our course. Now, it's hard to understand everything about forces unless we really talk about Newton's laws. 
Newton's first law says that an object in motion will remain in motion at a constant velocity unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Now, what does that really mean to a regular person? Uh, how would I explain this to an eight-year-old? Well, to put more simply, we could say that if an object has constant velocity, then we know that all the forces acting on it must be balanced. And vice versa, if the forces acting on an object are balanced, then we know the object has constant velocity. Now, students frequently get confused because they think that if an object is at rest, that that is the only way for the forces to be balanced. And sure, if an object is not moving, that does mean that the forces are balanced. But even a car that's traveling at a constant velocity down the road, that has a balanced force. The drag that's pushing on the car and the tires that are pushing back forward to get the car to go forward balance each other out to make sure that the car travels at a constant velocity. Now a balanced force means that all of your forces that are pointing up are equal to all of the forces that are pointing down. And also all of your forces that are pointing to the left are equal to the forces pointing to the right. Now we talk about our force diagrams. Uh, we talk about these because force diagrams are important to solving our balanced force problems. These diagrams give us a visual representation of how these forces are playing out and how to balance them so we know which forces go in which directions. Now there's a few steps that we need to know to be able to draw these balanced force diagrams. The first is we begin by identifying the object or the objects that we want to analyze. That is called our system. For example, if we were talking about a train that's traveling down the track and we wanted to know what are all of the forces acting on the caboose, well, the caboose would be the system. And we have the train car in front of it pulling it forward and we have friction pulling it backwards. And the caboose is the entire system. If I wanted to talk about the entire train with all of the, the uh, carts together, then that whole thing would be the system and we could treat it as one object even though there's several different little cars. The next thing we need to do is identify any of those long range forces that are acting on it which we said is usually just the force of gravity that's pulling down. Then we identify all of the contact forces that are acting on our system. Now remember that the normal force is always going to be perpendicular and the frictional force is always going to be parallel. And the last thing we do is we draw the forces as arrows in the correct direction and the arrow length represents the magnitude of the force. So if we have a really big force pointing up, then we would draw a large arrow pointing up. If we have a really large gravitational force that's pulling down on an object, then we would draw a really large arrow pointing down for gravity. So let's take a look at some of these examples. We have a, a block laying on the table and it's not moving. It's just sitting there still. So what is our system? Uh, the block is our system. Um, and what are all the forces that are acting on it? Well, we have gravity that's pulling down and we also have the surface here that's pushing back up. Otherwise, the block would fall down. Now, to draw the force diagram, we would draw it like this where the dot represents our system and these arrows represent the forces. And we label this top arrow with the normal force and we label the bottom arrow the gravitational force. And this would be the force diagram for a block that's sitting motionless on a table. Now, what about something slightly more complicated, like uh, a sign hanging outside of uh, some old shop? Well, we first identify our system. This block is the system, and we want to know what are all the forces that are keeping it in place. Well, gravity would be pulling down, and we also have these two ropes to the side that are holding it up. So our dot represents the whole system. We have the force of gravity pulling down, and now we have to think about these two tension forces. Are they pulling straight up? Well, no, we have these two that are at a diagonal, so we draw our diagonal arrows and label them. This is one of our tension forces and this is another tension force. The last example that we're going to do is a block that is at rest sitting on some sort of incline, like on a ramp. Well, once again, we identify the block is our system. This ramp is just the surface it's sitting on. 
Now, it might be helpful for us to just temporarily draw this little triangle next to this, even though this triangle, this, this gray triangle on the side, doesn't really have anything to do with the actual force diagram. I just wanted to include this so that we could see where our uh, arrows are going to be pointing. So the first thing we look at is the forces of the, the, the long range forces, which is gravity that's pulling it down. So we draw our gravitational force pointing straight down. The next thing we think about are the contact forces. Well, I have this surface that's pushing up on the block, and the normal force, remember, is always perpendicular to the surface. Since the surface is at an angle, then our normal force is going to be perpendicular to that angle. Now, are we done? Well, if we look at this, this doesn't look quite right. I mean, we have our gravity that's pointing straight down, and we have this normal force that's kind of twisted to the side. It's actually pointing a little bit to the right. I don't have any forces pointing to the left. And a balanced force diagram means that our ups must be equal to the downs and the left has to be equal to the right. Well, remember we have friction, right? Friction is holding this up on that ramp. If there were no friction, we would know that the block would slide down. So what direction is the friction? Remember that friction is a parallel force that's parallel to the surface. So it's either going to point up the ramp this way, or it'll point down the ramp. Well, the other criteria for the frictional forces is that it is opposing the motion, meaning it's going in the opposite direction of the direction that the block should be or that it is moving. In this case, it's not moving, but it should be moving down, which means the friction is opposing that motion and is pointing up at this diagonal, and we label that the force of friction. And now we have a small left force combined with our small-ish part of the normal force that's pointing to the right, and those balance each other out. And the total up, if we take the up part, the really, really small up of the frictional force, and the really big up part of the normal force, and that'll equal our gravitational force. And like I said, we don't really need that triangle right there, so I'd get rid of that, and this is our final force diagram, and would look like this. Hopefully, uh, this introduction to forces makes a bit of sense, and you can draw your own force diagrams. Uh, at the bottom of your guided notes, there's four little problems for you to try to solve. You can try to solve those and come and see me, and I'd be more than happy to show you if you're doing it right or wrong. Have a unbelievable rest of your day. You're unbelievable. <laughs>